I'm David Eagle, and I'm here to teach you the basics of playing the drums. You know, some people think any monkey can pound on a drum, and uh, that's probably true. But when you think about it, drums may just be the most difficult instrument to play well. Here's why. When you strike a note on a piano or on a guitar, it's already music. But drums and cymbals are a lot more like pots and pans. It takes a musical ear and a lot of coordination to keep them from sounding like uh, a day at the wrecking yard. At the beginning of this video, you saw some of the things that are possible. But in order to be able to express your musical ideas, you need a strong foundation, the basics. As we go through techniques together, don't hesitate to put your VCR on pause as you try them out. You know, with any creative art, there is usually more than one way to create. But I'll try to draw you a map of one of the best ways I know so that you don't have to guess where you're going. This is a snare drum, one of the most important pieces of gear in your drum set. It gets its name from these curly wires called snares stretched across the sensitive bottom head. When you tap on the top head, it causes the bottom head to vibrate, which causes the snares to buzz, like this. This is the strainer, which throws the snares off or on. For sticks, I prefer several different types, depending on the type of music I'm playing. For instance, I may use one like this, a 5A, if I'm playing lighter types of music like funk or jazz or Latin music. On the other hand, if I'm playing rock, I may use something heavier like this, a rock stick. It gives me a fatter sound and I don't have to work as hard to play loud. But for practicing, there's a definite advantage to using a different kind of a stick. Let me show you. These are called Drum Basics Practice Sticks. They are much larger, as you can see. I, I think they're kind of sexy myself. And they have special markings on them to help you get the most out of a practice session. Like, for instance, these rings around the stick allow you to see at a glance that you're holding both sticks in exactly the same way. Maybe farther back for power, maybe farther up front for better bounce. The dark tip allows you to see at a glance that you're lifting both sticks to exactly the same height for evenness of sound. The red body of the stick allows you to track your vertical motion in midair. I'll speak more about that later. But since I'll be referring to parts of the stick as we go, let me tell you their names. The tip is called the bead, then the neck, then the shoulder. Most of the stick is called the body, and finally, the butt end. But now, the grip. Divide the stick into three equal parts. 
One third from the butt end is where to grip. Now, how to grip. Anything you do with a musical instrument, you want to be as relaxed as possible because if you go against nature, you lose. Now, let your hand drop to your side. Notice the natural position of your hand. Bring that natural position up to the where to grip and you're almost there. The stick will sit between these two joints on your index finger so that you can wrap it around for control. The straight thumb goes immediately on the other side, not bent because that would cause tension. This part of the grip is called the fulcrum. It's the pivot point. The next finger wraps around the same way and the last two fingers wrap around loosely for support and will serve other functions as you get more advanced. Now the left stick we hold in one of two ways. The first is called traditional grip. Open your hand like this, take the where to grip part of the stick and place it in the V created by your thumb and index finger. That will become the fulcrum. Now bring these other two fingers underneath like this and the other two fingers loosely over the top, again for support, and will serve those same other functions as we get more advanced. A traditional grip was originally created to compensate for the awkward positioning of a marching drum. But as it's developed, it definitely gives the player a different feeling and a different sound. But in order to get you up playing sooner, we'll concentrate on match grip. And now you're sitting behind the drum for the first time. Your grip's matched in both hands, the back of your hand parallel to the floor, your wrist flat, and the back of the stick slightly to the outside of your wrist so it doesn't get in the way of your motion. Always sit up straight and let your body support your limbs so they can move freely, the way the door frame supports the hinges so the door can swing. Always be aware of the natural motion of your hands and arms. Imagine that the tip of the stick is moving straight up and down as if in a vertical groove. And now the moment we've all been waiting for. Striking the drum. I bet you wondered why that was there. In a natural and relaxed way, we're going to do something called pulling the sound out of the drum. If you let the stick bounce off the head, the tone of the drum can sing out. But if you mash the stick into the head like this, you'll not only be killing the natural sound and response of the drum, but you'll also be fighting your own muscles. There's no use making things harder on yourself and being less musical besides. Here's a simple bounce exercise. Hold the stick loosely in your right hand by only the fulcrum. Allow the stick to fall by gravity and let the natural bounce of the stick and head carry it back up. Make sure you're striking a bit off center. This is a good warm up exercise, by the way. And warming up is important. You'll want to develop a routine of slow warm up exercises because, just like an athlete, you need to warm up your muscles so that they're not shocked by suddenly playing fast. The exercises in the upcoming rudiment section should be part of your routine. And now a quick rundown on simple note reading. Now don't get scared, this is easy stuff, just simple arithmetic. I'm not doing this to complicate your life, but just to give you a basic understanding so you could walk into any music store and take advantage of all the great drum books. So you won't be limited to just what you can pick up off a record, and you'll be able to read drum charts and keep learning new licks. And we'll start off with a measure of 4-4 time, the most common division of time you'll ever see. Now a measure, also known as a bar, is what we call the space between this line and this line. In this bar, a quarter note gets the main pulse, signified by the bottom four. The top four tells you how many quarter notes are in this bar, four. And we count it, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. It, logically, if you take those four quarter notes and add them together, what do you get? A whole note. A whole note looks like this. If you divide that whole note in half, you get two half notes. A half note looks like this. If you take the original quarter notes we started with and divide each of those in half, we get eight eighth notes. Eighth notes look like this singly or in groups like this. We count that one and two and three and four and. These notes that I've showed you 
tell you when to play or strike the instrument. Just as important as when not to play, those times are represented by what we call a rest. Rests have values just like notes do. For instance, a whole note rest looks like this. A half note rest looks like this. A quarter note rest looks like this. And an eighth note rest looks like this. When you see a rest, you don't play for the length of time represented by the value of that rest. See, easy stuff. Okay, okay, it'll make more sense as we go. Congratulations, you made it to the rudiment section. A rudiment is like a building block. It's a pattern that's been accepted after years of development as a basic principle of playing drums. A great way to practice rudiments other than on a drum is on a practice pad for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's quieter so you can practice longer without mental fatigue and uh, your neighbors won't hate you. And when I was a kid, I swear my neighbors had a contract out on me. And it's portable. I mean, some of the best players, some of the fiends, take them with them wherever they go. I mean, some even walk around the house like this with their pad and practice like this all day. I am not kidding. This one, by the way, has zones on it so you can practice accuracy and patterns as if you're moving around your drum set. Now imagine being able to take your drum set with you to the library. I'm back. Did you miss me? Hey, the first exercise we'll discuss is a single stroke roll. Each hand plays a single stroke. Here's a great exercise for developing your wrist and forearm, and especially for control. Now remember that word, control. In this exercise, we're gonna begin by holding the stick in the up position with a firm but relaxed grip. Now I know that may sound like a contradiction. How could it be firm and relaxed? After you've practiced a while and you've developed this muscle, you'll realize you don't have to be tense to have a good firm grip. And that's part of control. See, I said it again. It's important. Let the stick drop by gravity, your hand following it down, and just as you feel it touch the pad, snap it back up with your wrist. This exercise is called snap-ups. Set your electronic metronome at 50 beats per minute, or quarter note equals 50. If you don't have an electronic metronome, get one. You're gonna need it. I mean, it's like a faithful dog. You can always uh, count on it. Anyway, it's down snap up on one, rest on two, down snap up on three, rest on four. Let's try it. One, two, and three, and four, and one, and two, and three, and four, and one, and two, and three, and four, and one, and two, and three, and four, and. You'll probably feel it in your wrist and forearm after a while. If you don't, I'll be real impressed because I do just about every time. And now we'll try it with the left hand. One and two and three and four and one two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four. We'll alternate one and Good. Next, an exercise we'll call high taps. Start the right stick in the same up position, allow the stick to drop by gravity, tap the pad lightly, and stop its natural rebound about one inch off the pad. On two, we'll pull the stick back up. On three, down again. And on four, back up. Let's try it. One and two and three and four and one and two 
and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and do these slowly at first let's try the left four and one and two and three and 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 four let's alternate two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one two three four very good next low taps we start in the down position about one inch off the pad notice on one i lift the stick very slightly and tap on two we rest on three we tap and on four we rest let's try it one and two and three and four and one two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and let's try the left one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four alternate one and two and three and four one and two and three and four one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and very good let's take a vcr break now and practice the low taps and the high taps next double strokes two strokes in each hand also known as the open roll it sounds like this first we'll try wrist style with a firm but relaxed grip set your metronome at 50 almost like snap-ups with two strokes in each hand one and two and three and four and 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 and as you get the feel of these you can speed up the metronome gradually but practice these slowly at first wrist style tends to be for slow to medium tempos tempo by the way is the overall speed of the song or the exercise the pattern it also makes it easier, by the way, in wrist style to move from drum to drum on your drum set. Bounce style is very valuable, though, for faster tempos and patterns. Okay, you've got double strokes, you've got single strokes. Now let's combine them, the five-stroke roll. It's right double, left double, right single. And as it continues, You'll notice you're leading with your left hand. Left double, right double, left single. It naturally alternates. And now you're back again leading with your right. Don't forget to keep the single stroke down as I do. Let's try it. Set your metronome at 50. One and two and three and four and 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 this is what you're trying to achieve. Okay, take a VCR break and practice those.
All right, you've got the five stroke rolls. Let's move up to the seven stroke rolls. That's right, right, left, left, right, right, left. You'll notice you're back leading with your right hand. It does not naturally alternate. All right, let's set the metronome and let's try. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four. 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 Let's try leading left hand. Two, three, four. One and two and three and four. One and two and three and four. Now remember this too. If the metronome is too fast at this setting, please don't hesitate. Slow the metronome down. Make it comfortable for yourself so that it doesn't hurt. It should be comfortable. All right, uh, let's try a VCR break. And don't forget wrist and bounce styles for all these. And by the way, this is what you're after in that exercise. Okay, take that break. What next? Nine stroke rolls, you guessed it. Right, right, left, left, right, right, left, left, right. Now you notice it naturally alternates. And I've written this as simply as possible. I've made it as simple as possible for you. So let's try it. Set your metronome at 50. One and two and three and four and 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 one and two and three and four and. Okay, let's take a VCR break and practice the nine stroke rolls. Okay, now for something new, the paradiddle. You'll find that a lot of names for patterns in drumming come from how they sound, like for instance, pea soup. I'll show you that later on the hi-hat. And then another one is bucket of fish, bucket of fish. John Bonham used to do that one all the time. Anyway, the paradiddle is one of those. You know, you'll, you'll see, you'll start coming up with silly names for your own patterns too. But the paradiddle is two single strokes, and a double stroke, or paradiddle, paradiddle. The double stroke, or diddle, makes it naturally alternate. Let's try this one. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. And up to tempo, it sounds a little more like this. Of course, that was wrist style. Anyway, let's move up to the double paradiddle. That's, of course, two paras and a diddle, or four single strokes and a double. Para, para, diddle, para, para, diddle. This one's actually in three, four time. That was the easiest way to write it, which means that there are only three quarter notes in that bar. And we count it one and two and three and one and two and three and. Set the metronome at 50 and let's try it. One and two and three and one and two and three and. One and two and three and one and two and. Three three and one and two and three and one and two and three and. Very good. Now what's next? You guessed it. The triple paradiddle. Three paras in a diddle. This could go on forever. Anyway, as you might guess, it's para, 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 diddle. Pa, ra, pa, and so on. Let's try it. Set to metronome at 50. One 
and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and and this is how this is how it's supposed to sound. Take a VCR break and practice those. Okay, the next one of the last two is the flam. Now the flam is a low tap played immediately in front of a high tap. And by the way, a note played that closely in front of another note is called a grace note. In this case, it's a right hand lead flam, which means that the left hand is playing the low tap. Or you can reverse it. Or you can alternate it. Let me show you some flam patterns, just improvised, mixed in with some other things, just to show you how cool they sound. Anyway, practice those flams. And last but not least important of the rudiments that I'm going to show you is the press roll or buzz roll. And it sounds something like this. A great exercise for practicing this is to take the stick in the right hand by the fulcrum, actually by these three fingers. Let the other fingers loose just for support. Press it into the head without killing the natural vibration of the head and see how long you can get it to bounce. Do the same with the left. Now the secret to bringing the buzzes together is to overlap their sound. In other words, one begins before the last one ends. Try for a continuous sound. It takes a little practice, but some guys can actually get this to sound like paper tearing. Anyway, take a break, practice the buzz rolls, and get back to me. Let's talk about the bass drum pedal. The part that strikes the head is called the beater. Some of them have a hard surface and a soft surface, so you have a choice of sounds. Some may only have one. The spring tension adjustment is here. That's what decides how difficult it is to push the pedal down and how fast it comes back up. My suggestion at first is to set it at what feels comfortable. Probably you'll be looser. But as you get more advanced, I think you'll find you'll readjust and maybe make it tighter. Remember, you can't come down again until the pedal comes back up. My suggestion for stool height is to get your upper leg as close to parallel with the floor as possible. At first, you might find it more comfortable to sit higher, but I think as you develop, you'll realize and you'll feel a little more control closer to parallel. I find this to be a good distance from the drum and this to be a comfortable angle for my leg. Also, you'll find you'll want to sit as close to the edge of the stool as possible so that nothing gets in the way of your leg movement. I'm going to show you some bass drum exercises, and we're going to practice them two different ways. The first is with your foot flat on the footboard, heel down. This is the more traditional and subtle way. The second will be with your heel slightly off the footboard, using more of your leg. This is the more powerful way. Remember snap-ups? They're back. 
What we're going to do, we're going to start off flat-footed. We're going to tap the drum as lightly as possible on one, snap back up on two, tap again on three, and snap back up on four. Set your metronome at 50, like before. We'll make all of them 50. That'll be the easiest. One and two and three and four and one and three and four and one and two and three and four. This is where control comes from. Okay, now we're going to try to heel up. Two and three and four and one and two and three and four. If you feel tension while you're playing with the, these exercises, stand up and walk around a couple of times. If you feel tension in your arms, shake them out. And of course, if you feel tension while you're playing, like in the middle of a song on stage, find ways to shake it out while you keep playing. It's the only way you'll keep your gig. Now on to bass drum low taps. We'll try them flat-footed, heel down first. One and two and three and four and 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 one and two and three and heel up. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. This is where control comes from. Let's take a VCR break and practice the high taps and the low taps. Here are five simple bass drum exercises I've outlined for you. I'm going to play them heel up, but I want you to practice them both heel up and heel down. Let's set our metronome at 50 and go. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four. One and two and three and four and one Exercise two. One and two and three and four and 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 one and two and three and four. Exercise three. Exercise four. Exercise five. That'll give you control. Take that VCR break practice break. Quick word about the hi-hat. Obviously, this is the pedal that pulls the cymbals down together. And there are several adjustments for playing style. There's a spring adjustment down here, just like on the bass drum pedal. There's an adjustment here for the height of the cymbals. Some rock guys like to play them way up there, and jazz guys like to play them way down here. And there's an adjustment here for the distance 
between symbols. That's a good place to start. That's what I suggest. As you can see, there's a lot of logic in the way things are placed around me. The drums are close together and angled toward me or one another. The cymbals are not too high and, again, facing me. This allows me to use what's called economy of motion. In other words, I don't have to move any more than I need to to strike a drum or a cymbal. In contrast to the set you saw earlier in the video, where the cymbals might have been higher and flatter and a lot of other wacky things, honestly, that's really for showbiz. But I like the way it looks. But, of course, this is a lot more logical. On the other hand, this kind of a movement looks a lot cooler from the hundredth row than this. But then again, I use a set just like this on a lot of things I do. Experiment. You will make your own choices. A few words now on tuning. This is the shell. This is the rim or counter hoop. This, of course, is the head, you knew that. And these are the tensioning rods. Now, when you tighten the tensioning rods, it pulls the hoop down, which stretches the head over the edge of the shell. Now, to, to begin to tighten a brand new head, we start off with this drum key and the circular method. We tune each tensioning rod just until it catches in the clockwise direction. Then we go to the crisscross method, going around the drum, to achieve relatively even tension. The next step is to tap lightly next to each one of the tensioning rods, compare their sound, and then tighten or loosen the ones that don't match. And then the final tweak, this is fun, is to press in the center of the head with your fist, and that stretches the head and evens out the tension. A tighter tuning gives you a brighter sound with faster rebound. Looser tuning gives you a deeper, wetter sound. Experiment. And a great way to get a classic bass drum sound is just tune it low and stick a pillow inside. As you become a drummer, one of the first jokes you'll hear, if you haven't heard it already, is what do they call a guy who hangs around with musicians? A drummer. See what I mean? But, you know, in deference to us drummers, I like to think of myself as a drummist. I mean, there's a lot of music here. This is not just a bunch of pots and pans. You know, check it out. There's a lot of tonal variation here. Or you can play on the rim. Or you could hit the head and the rim together. That's a rim shot. Or maybe a cross stick. That's really effective. Or what about the back of the stick on the snare? Or we can throw the snares off and play with mallets. Or, or these brushes. Or these wood wax. Or these brushes. these baseball bats. Or well, maybe these. You see what I'm getting at? There's no limit. Don't let anybody tell you what you can't do. I had these made for me. If, if you think it's cool and you do it with attitude, it's cool. Now I'm going to show you some patterns you can play along with a band. I bet you thought we'd never get to this part. Well, you've been good. You've been taking your VCR breaks regularly, and you deserve it. You have been, haven't you? Well, then here we go. Eighth notes on the hi-hat. One and two and three and four. And one and two and three and four. And one and two and three and four. And now we'll add the bass drum on one and three. Two and three and four and 
Now we'll go back to just the hi-hat. One and two and three and four and we'll play two and four on the snare. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four. This is called the backbeat. Three and four and one and two and three and four. Back to the hi-hat. Back to the bass drum. One and two and three and four and one and two and at the snare with it. One and two and three and four and 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 simple but effective. Millions have been made with just that beat. Now I'm going to show you some simple variations of patterns. And it'll be easy to see what I'm doing because I'll only change one thing at a time. My suggestion is to watch the whole series and then go back and practice them one at a time till they feel good, till they feel comfortable, and just plain fun. But when you practice these, set your metronome at 50. But right now, just watch what I'm doing. One and two and three and four and... Now go back and practice these one by one and come back and report to me. Okay, so now you have some different patterns you can play in a song. Now most songs have several musical parts to them. So how do we link together the different patterns and musical parts with what's called a fill? It fills the space musically, it creates transition, it signals the upcoming change in the music, and it creates excitement. All that. So now I'm going to play some fills for you, linking together some of the patterns I've already shown you. And then you can go back and practice them one at a time. Here we go.
notice I moved the floor tom over a little bit so you could see my bass drum easily. And one thing though, keep in mind that the style of the fill has to fit the style of the song. You wouldn't want to play a wild and crazy fill in a soft love song, would you? Unless of course you wanted her to think that you were wild and crazy about her. And uh, I guess that would do it. Anyway, practice these one at a time. Okay, now I'm going to show you some coordination exercises, a way to coordinate your hands with your feet. And you could even use these as fills. We're going to start off right hand lead, but when you practice it, also practice it left hand lead. And when you practice it, set your metronome at 60. But right now, I'm going to approximate it, and you can let me slide. One and two and three and four and... Exercise two. One, two, exercise three. Exercise four. One, two, exercise five. Take a VCR break and practice these. Okay, now I'll speed them up a little bit and show you how they sound as fills. And you can even string them together. Watch. Go back and practice them one at a time, and then string them together. You choose the order. Great. Now, if you've been practicing all along as I've asked you to, then you're ready to play with other musicians. But keep in mind a few things. You must fit in with the band as a team player. Even if you're not all great musicians technically, if you're listening to one another and how your parts relate, you'll be making music. Some of the most memorable bands of all time were made up of average players, but the sum total of their creative talents made them classic acts. I won't name them, but you probably know who they are. Two of the most important attributes of a good drummer are first, solid time. That's why you should always practice with a metronome. Any recording session you do, the odds are you'll be playing along with one, so get used to it now. And second, Locking in with the bass player. My buddy here, Larry Seymour, and I are gonna play some grooves for you. Some of the patterns I showed you earlier, but we'll add a bass line. Here we go.
Let me leave you with a few basic thoughts. The main function of a drummer is to keep solid musical time. If you can do only that, other musicians will want to play with you really bad. Now, space is important, too. What you don't play is as important as what you do play, sometimes more. Now, to develop and maintain a good concept of space and time, it's always important to practice with a metronome or a drum machine. Find one with a headphone jack so you can hear it while you're playing. Playing along with records, by the way, is a great way to develop a musical approach to playing time. It, it makes mechanical exercises seem more musical, and you get to play along with and learn from some of the great musicians of all time. Always set goals, too, in your practicing and in your career, if a career is what you have in mind. Play, uh, play with musicians as often as possible, with other musicians. Listen to what they're playing and try to think of ways you can complement it. In other words, concentrate on your part in relation to what everybody else is doing. Remember, it's like a great recipe. If you change one thing, one ingredient, it may not taste as good or it may taste better. Listen to as many types of music as possible, too. Uh, even, kinds, even types without drums. I mean, for instance, Chopin is one of my favorites. And uh, that guy had some fire. Uh, you know, the more kinds of music you listen to, the more ideas you'll have. Because uh, technique is nothing without a musical ear. But uh, the more ideas you practice, the more tools you'll have to express those ideas. I'll say it again. There is no absolute right way. So don't be afraid to experiment, no matter what anybody tells you how it should be done. <laughs> and I urge you, watch this video over and over again. One, because I'm a pretty captivating guy. And two, because it's easy to miss certain small things. Don't be like the guy who goes to see a Bruce Lee movie just once and now he knows karate. You gotta practice a lot. And one last thing, above all, drums are a very physical instrument. It's easy to get tense when you're pushing yourself to the limit. The best way I know of to stay in control and have a good time is to relax and have fun. Hey, we formed a hot little group, a little trio, to play for you at the end of this video. And we gave it an Italian name, Tulare. And that name has really deep significance for me because the other two guys in the band are both named Larry. Larry Treadwell and Larry Seymour. But before we play for you, just one last trick. You're going to love this. As far as I know, I'm the only guy on the planet that can pull this off. Check it out. Pretty cool, huh? Hey, thanks. I'll see you later. Do we get it? We got it? Good. Where are those two Larrys? <laughs>